um, in either a new project or your existing project, load lung one H and E. When you're learning how to be a pathologist, you basically envy the the people who are training you, who somehow can look at every slide and understand this was a goat from you know <laughs> southern Texas, and you know this is what happened to it just by looking at an H and E slide. So from the beginning, you kind of at least in the veterinary world, you start playing this game of without any information, what is this? First of all, it's lung. You can tell that by these uh, alveoli uh, and sort of the the net like um, alveolar, what's called the alveolar interstitium or these uh, capillaries at which air exchange happens. I would guess this is from a mouse based on the scale of it. That would make this uh, what's called an inducible balt, bronchus and bronchial associated lymphoid tissue. Humans have sort of resting balt. There's balt there in the resting state. In mice, it's it's inducible. So this is obviously, th this is a blood vessel here. It's, it's sitting next to some blood vessels, but, and you could say that this is just around this vessel, but you know, it could be a few microns over that you actually have the bronchial and, you know, often the vessels and the airways do run together. Uh, there's, this is a very busy, uh, very busy uh, slide, a lot of pathology going on here. You see these cells with, uh, with uh, bilobe nuclei, uh, and also they have this sort of uh, bright eosinophilic cytoplasm. Here you can sort of make out the granular nature of, of what's pink, right? It's not just pink because uh, it's sort of a solid pink, but basically you have this coalescence um, of these uh, kind of granular things. So that makes these eosinophils. Um, you also have these cells, which contain this sort of brown-green pigment. I would guess that these are hemosiderophages, and what that means is a macrophage that has previously ingested red blood cells. And when the iron in the red blood cell no longer belongs in the heme group and is, is red, uh, it's in some sort of oxidized state and uh, it turns brown. Um, you could visualize this using like a Prussian blue stain. Uh, there's a chance that this is lipofusion. So there's this inducible bulk, there's uh, eosinophils, um, and uh, in the alveoli, you have these free-floating cells too. And this is sort of classic macrophage morphology. Um, you have a large round cell, and then this cell, this nucleus, if you'll notice, has sort of a kidney shape. Uh, that's what a pathologist referred to as a reniform nucleus, a reniform meaning kidney shape. So um, these are the blood vessels. You can see the, uh, the erythrocytes uh, are there. R blood, blood vessels don't always have erythrocytes in them, but sometimes they do. It just depends on sort of histologic processing, where your particular section was relative to gravity when the animal sort of died and the blood coagulated, all these things. This is some, some plasma inside the a larger blood vessel. And then um, over here, you have the airways. And um, similar to, to the colon, you can see that the airway is lined by these um, columnar epithelial cells uh, with, uh, with basal or nuclei. So this would be a bronchial. Um, humans sometimes have cartilage around airways, which are called uh, bronchi within the, the lung parenchyma but um, rodents uh, or mice do not. So uh, they just have uh, bronchioles because there's no cartilage surrounding the airways inside, the, uh, inside the, the, the lung. And then this is a branch point. I know it, it's probably a little hard to say, but I would guess that the beginning of this uh, airway is over here. And then as the airway comes over here, it's dipping in and out of section. And then you have a, a branch point and we're barely catching uh, sort of the, you know, the, the split of the Y of the branch point. And here you have a bunch of um, epithelial cells that are in tangential section. You have to be very careful interpreting necrosis or degradation of, of epithelial cells because you don't know kind of the fixation conditions and whatnot. And I see a, a shadow in my blind spot, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> and when there are three pathologists in the room, there are seven opinions, so we will not call you onto stage to express them. <laughs> so as we did a bunch yesterday, we're going to start by uh, setting the same deconvolution. Find a region with some nice nuclei, some nice uh, eosin. I like using red blood cells for this because they're actually pure eosin and some background. Draw a smallish rectangle. We're going to unfill that. Analyze, estimate stain vectors. I have a question about the size when you're doing this. Like, yeah. does the size dictate the accuracy at all? Like, is it better to do small or is it better to do large? It's How better to do small. 
um, because uh, QPath is, has to process every pixel individually. And if you do big, it'll actually downsample to make that possible. And then you're losing some of your extremes. Yes, you want to reset the modal values. Um, and hit auto. And sure, we can, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Once, once your lines look, yes. Um, so for cells that are positive for chemotopsin or ESN, like yes. those iron rich cells, yes. where would they end up after deconvolution? Would it be like in the residual channel? In the residual, I'm going to show you that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. It, okay. Oh, um, it thinks that this is an HDAB image. That's incorrect. So just for my own sanity, I'm going to go to the image tab, double click on HDAB. I'm saying, nope, it's actually an H&E. Apply. And then we do um, estimate stain vectors. Okay. Cool. Um, so then we can see the nuclei look good, the red blood cells look good, and as Mark just mentioned, um, uh, pressing four gets you the residual channel which is usually pretty uninteresting. Um, but in this particular case, uh, I don't know, can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Uh, these, uh, I don't know the words, ugly macrophages uh, <laughs> um, light up really nicely in the residual. If you wanna see that better, you can go to the brightness contrast settings, click residual and adjust this. No, no, not that part. Just that down and there are those cells. Okay. Then we're going to do the cell detection again. Um, and I'm going to grab a couple of the like healthiest regions, a couple of the inflamed regions, and go to analyze. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, analyze, cell detection, cell detection. And let's see how these cells work. Ah, um, before what when we were having the Q and A, I was playing with the um, uh, visualization, and I turned on centroids, and that's not what I want right now. So I'm going to right click cells, nuclei, and cell boundaries. Um, okay. So as you're looking around, just see if it's good. Um, pay particular attention to the eosinophils because those are going to come up later. And it does okay, but I I like having more I like having more pixels. Okay. Um and I also not good. Those cells are merged. That cell's merged. That cell's merged. Okay, I'm gonna drop. What's what's Ken? What is this? Oh, so remember the uh, the cells that have the brown pigment? Mm -hmm. Those are. Uh, what, I, what I said are likely uh, hemocytophages. Mm -hmm. So an earlier stage of that would be that the macrophages have to ingest the red cell. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a uh, macrophage which has uh, ingested a lot of red cells which have started to break down, but the heme has not lost its color yet. Um, sometimes you get things like viral inclusion bodies and whatnot, but uh, I kind of don't think so. Okay. Well. Right. I reached the threshold to get rid of um it was picking up some of these like little granule things. Uh, which, oh, yeah. Cool. So if you run your command and you see something like this on the screen, it's because your detections are currently hidden from view. Okay, so pay attention to the slider on the top and to the buttons that are pressed um on the bar. Um and um the context help really helps. So if you're in trouble, 
use the compass still. So from here, I would need you both to turn on my detections and increase my opacity. Whatever your settings are, they are, they are good enough for now. Uh, um, we're going to delete this. Uh, do not keep descendant objects. Got it right that time. Um, make a full uh, image annotation, which is objects, annotate, annotations, create full image annotation. You get a rectangle. And then um, we run your uh, cell detection on everything. Make sure make measurements is checked. That's that first important. Detection. And that should take about a minute to process, depending on your speed. On your computer, it's going to take a lot longer, right? That's the importance of the hardware um, in running your analysis. Um, you can view almost every slide on your laptop, but you probably will benefit from having a very solid workstation when doing a lot of work. From here, I want everyone to save. Um, Pete mentioned we need, um, these object classifiers are based on measurements. There's the default ones that came with the cell detection, but we're gonna add a couple more um, because we're gonna need them to find some eosinophils. So we're going to select detections. So objects, select, select detections, select cells. And then, um, analyze, calculate features, add intensity features. Um, we want to add the uh, hematoxylin and eosin features, and we want to do the paralytic features. These are the measures of texture, and our um, eosinophils light up really well um, with some eosin paralytic features. We also want the pixel size. Uh, no, this is a point. Um, this image has 0.11. Um, pixel size. So 0.11, the region is the ROI, which is the region of interest. So this means it's going to measure um, every cell individually for hematoxylin and eosin paralytic features. Hit run. And we want to process all selected objects. Um, I'm also going to select the annotation instead of the cells. So selecting just the rectangle going to analyze, calculate features, add smooth features. Um, yeah. uh, 25 microns is a good radius. Done. Now, uh, we're going to... Would those measurements show up so we can verify that it actually calculated? Uh, click on any cell, oh, okay. and then go to, um, they'll be at the bottom of the list here. So we did the parallel me measurements first, um, because um, when you do the smooth me measurements, it calculates that for every measurement in every cell. So you want to do your like individual cell measurements, and then smooth, smooth everything. I am going to right click um, and go to reset to default classes. Uh, sorry, I'm in the class list. Right click, reset to default classes. Um, just to clean this up a little bit, every time you start QPath, uh, sorry, every time you start QPath for the first time on any computer, this is what you see. And um, we're going to find these bolts, these inducible bolts, these inflammatory regions. Um, and this is where, um, this, this section right here is why we spent so much time practicing annotations yesterday, because we're gonna do a lot of drawing and parentheses are gonna matter. Um, so I'm gonna hit the brush tool. I'm going to draw some, let me turn on my detections, just kind of draw, just draw, grab a bunch of cells in a lymphoid region, in a lymphoid region. Click on immune cells and hit set class. Once we get into the classifier training, how QPath is going to interpret this is every cell that is inside this random shape I just drew, um, it should believe is an immune cell. So what really matters is if the centroid is on the inside of the shape. So these cells are immune cells right now. These cells are unclassified. It just doesn't know we're not using that. I'm also going to draw 
a just over the healthy region here and set that class as other. Yes. Yeah. And we classify already as the mono. Can we change the yep. limit you, of the rack? You can add. Okay. This one's not the other one. The alter option. Uh, the, you, can, you can just edit um, the shape and it will go from there. Okay. Um, if you don't want to keep hitting set class, what you can do is pick a class you feel like focusing on and hit auto set. And then you can just start drawing and it will automatically set it um, and then switch and switch classes and yeah. Um, and so you can see here what it's labeled as. You can also tell by the color. Okay, everyone's got a couple of annotations. Then we're going to go to classify, object classification, chain object classifier. Uh, let's start with like three and three, what we're going to iterate. You need at bare minimum one ob object uh, in each of two classes. If you don't have two different classes set, this screen is going to fail. Um, so you don't want to like select the cells, you want to annotate on top of the cells. If you do want to select them. Yes, um, for that we're going to use the points tool and we will get there. Um, so we, yes, uh, points tool is how you do that. Cool, hit live update. Um, and then I like to fill in... Oh, I, I turned on my... Um, I like to just have uh, cell boundaries only um, but do it whichever way, whichever way you like to look at it. And okay, uh, once again, I'm hitting D to turn them on and off. Um, and so in this case, purple means immune. Um, and yellow means not. I heard someone say what's going to be the next thing. This. These are bronchial epithelia. They are not immune cells, um, but they're going to come up as purple because they're dense. They're they've got a lot of nuclei. Um, they're they're like compressed. Um, I even honestly, when I was prepping this, I had to go to Ken and say like, these aren't immune cells, right? Because I wasn't completely sure. Um, so if if at this stage you're lost, ignore the epithelium. It's fine. Um, but I, what I would do is add another class called epithelium and start training on here. And you're just looking for to find your point. Um, and so what you're looking for uh, as you're doing this is mistakes. There definitely will be mistakes. It happens. Find some and correct some. So like that had been labeled. This cell right here is, it thinks it's epithelium. It's not. So I'm going to correct that. Um, one thing that's important um, that confuses people sometimes is the color is the results of the classifier, which might not necessarily agree with what whatever you just annotated. Um, if, if the classifier is super convinced that this cell really is a different type, it'll show you that even if it's under one of um, the annotations you've set. Well, that could either mean you've done something wrong or you have to retrain the classifier. Um, that's Thank you. 
Um, in general, it's good practice to try to balance your training sets. Um, this this pie chart here shows you how many of each class you train. You want them to be approximately a third each, kind of, sort of, a little. You just don't want like 99 and 1. Um, it's not important that it's perfect, but it is good practice to emphasize the stuff that is rare. Yeah. Okay, everyone's got... An acceptable classifier. Cool. Um, go back to this window and enter the classifier name. It could be anything you want. I'm gonna call it fault epi. Whatever you whatever makes sense to you. And save. I think in the instructions there I called it inflamed and healthy. Um, but whatever. Next up, um, so this is saved. Make sure you save it. Um, it's actually going to come up later, so really make sure you, make sure you save it. Does it say specific to this project for what that does? Specific to this project. So if you look in the project, there will be a classifier some folder. Yeah, you could drag that into another project, so you have a classifier from one project. So now that we've got the general region, I also want to look for eosinophils. But what I don't want to do is delete all of the nice annotations we just made. Um, the classifier that is saved, that now exists, it's written as a file. But that classifier is basically unchangeable. Like if I decide I'm not happy with the results, I can't load that JSON file and edit it. But that's not a thing. You have to go back to the original data and retrain it. Therefore, I don't want to delete all of this training I just did. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to the project tab, right click on my image, duplicate. Um, uh, hold on, before I do that, I'm going to save. Important. Save, yes, okay, now, now duplicate. And I do want to delete my, I uh, do want to duplicate my data files. Um, it'll give it a new name, uh, one. Um, actually, for clarity's sake, I'm going to call it. <laughs> and then double click the newly created image to open that. It won't look any different because it is literally exactly the same. Image. Okay. Then, yeah. Um, uh, go in, once you're there, go into your annotations tab, select all of your annotations except the big one that defines your whole image, delete, select everything else, and delete it. Okay. Um, from here, I'm going to, I, I want to clear um, the annotation classification, so I'm going to go objects. Uh, object, no, sorry, classify, object classification, V set detection classification. Now they're just all back to the body. So we're basically starting fresh, except the cells already exist, the extra measurements we made are still here, um, and so, but we can like start on a new classifier. There's objects. Uh, sorry, classify, Class object Class classification, reset. Okay. okay, so um, from here we want to look for eosinophils, um, which someone asked about before. Um, so we're going to use the points tool. You could do this with the brush tool if you're more comfortable with it. I um, For these like scattered small cells, I like the, it doesn't super matter what you use, the, the, the results will be the same. I'm going to show you this way. Um, so I'm going to pull up the counting tool. I'm going to make a new class called eosinophils. So I, I like basically initialized the class called eosinophils. Now I'm going to make a set of points objects. 
and declare them that these points objects are going to be these intervals. So you had to make the class, make the set of point objects, and then like set the point objects to that class. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna I'm going to delete that and just start over. Okay. So because we're classifying the eosinophils, I'm gonna um make make QPath aware that there's going to be a class called eosinophils. So uh still too fast. Right click, add, add class. Then I'm going to make a new, I'm going to open up the points counting tool. I'm going to say, I'm going to make a set of points. This is a brand new set of points and everything I'm about to label is going to be in an ESNFL. So I'm going to go to the class and hit set. So now it knows that there's going to be a set of points, currently zero because I haven't added anything, but they're going to be used. Um, then start clicking on some of the bells. These circles are very large, so I'm going to just make them a little smaller. The size of the circle doesn't matter, it's just for visualization. All it's it's like one infinitesimally small point. It's click, 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 click. If you make a mistake, like oops, that's not an isinabel. Um, either option or alt and click it again. Um, once I've done a bunch, I'm going to um, go to the move tool, either by pressing M or by pressing this crosshairs. Go somewhere else in the tissue if you just want a varied set. Click back here. Um, click this points again. And click, click. So label and yes and else, that some number. Then add another another set of points. So now we've got the Isinfo set, um, and this is gonna be a new set that is going to be the ignore region. Um, uh, the ignore class, sorry, ignore class. So these are going to be everything else in the world that isn't an Isinfo. and select the ignore, select the three dots, and start clicking. Click on anything. Um, you can merge the annotation types you do for this, right? So you can click on your cinephils, but then, you know, if the majority aren't, you can just, you know, absolutely like a giant area. Yes. <laughs> whatever, whatever works for you. Um, okay. On the left is some examples of things that are eosinophils. On the right are some examples of confusingly close but not eosinophil cells. So you want to not get confused with cells next to red blood cells, with plasma cells, with myocytes, et cetera. Um, you want to click on red blood cells, just tell it it's not. Yeah. And OK, while I'm doing this, um, I usually have the um, detection outlines off, um, just because it's so it's so hard to see the incinophils in the first place that if you were to have the red lines on top, I find that really confusing. Um, but it is important to remember all it's actually classifying um, are the detections themselves. So if you put a point out here, like here's a red blood cell, I'm calling that not an eosinophil. QPath is ignoring this entirely. Like it does not care about that point because that point is not related to a cell. So like, it, it that does not add to the training at all. Um, it's only caring about which cells specifically you're working on. But there's nothing bad about selecting it. And like, it's not gonna hurt it, it's okay. gonna ignore it. Yes. 
like if you want to say this whole where's my where's my going none of this is uh um none of that's an easy film so i just marked 10 of them um okay also uh for those of you who are like know a little bit about machine learning um each cell here is one training point so like i've got 12 and 16 and i don't know 10 whatever number that is uh training that's my entire training set is approximately 28 data points okay once you've annotated a bunch we're going to train a new classifier classify object classifier train object classifier. Once again, we're just going to go live update. Okay. I don't know how to hide this. Okay. So what is it seeing? Um, Okay, I gotta be honest, when I first saw this, I'm like, oh, it's making a ton of mistakes. But no, there's just a lot of eosinophils. This is just a badly inflamed balloon. Um, so the process of iterating um, is just find mistakes, correct them. Uh, yeah, like that. So like this, I believe is, should be counted. So I'm gonna click on my eosinophil uh, point counter. I'm going to, um, click on the three dots and say that that should count. And I'm going to say that this cell right here, which is actually just a small cell next to a red blood cell, should not count. Neither should that one. Very becoming a morphologist. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to you a lot. Um, yes, yeah, super good point. Um, if you don't know what you're looking for, you can't tell Kipa what to look for. It doesn't know anything. It's really entirely reliant on you. Go find go find a pathologist. They know things. <laughs> they know so many things. Would it always respect the when you add when you correct it? Would it mm -hmm. always it, it's just retraining. Uh which either means you're wrong and your classifier is better than you, which happens. Um or your classifier is so bad you need a whole bunch more training data. Um and it's fun that it could be either and those are completely opposites. And, and kind of on that point, it's again only being based off that numerical measurement. It does yes. not see the cell. So if you do not have a measurement that represents the genes you want to try to train it and handle, it's not going to work. So that's why there are so many different measurement options. Yes. Why is the ignore red? Um, the ignore means do not be classified. Okay. So it started so as not. If you wanted a different color, just call it something else. Yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, a couple of tricks. Uh, you can um, click none and hit space um, to make the none, make the ignored cells disappear, which makes it really obvious when you go, oh, oh, um, this should have been a use of What I just did? Yes. Oh, uh, click on none and hit space, and then it hides those cells, which, like, to your eyes makes it really easy to find the things. So the thing I just did is I um, tried to make that neocynical, and instead I accidentally classified it as ignore. So I'm going to delete that. Click on neocynical. Hi. Um, so this process can take a while. Um, you don't want to spend too long on it because uh, it will drive you insane. <laughs> um, no, no, it's bad. Uh, but especially at the beginning, it'll take you a bit to do it fast. Okay, so fun bug report that we just found out. Um, for some of your computers, I don't know what the pattern is. Uh, if it's just crashing, you can switch from random trees to artificial neural networks. Um, these are different algorithms for training a classifier. The final result is just a classifier. It's, it just affects how all of the math gets to the end result. And you can see it does, um, it, affects, it affects what gets classified. Uh, I am not a machine learning expert. I can't tell you in which situations you want one or the other. Um, random trees usually work. Uh, that's Alex, why it's Alex, the fault. Alex, 
yeah, val validate yourself. Also, just try things. See what happens. See what what's good. Okay. Also, you can go to in this window, train object classifier, classifier, edit. If these mean something to you, great. They mean nothing to me. But some of some of the people in this room understand what these things are. But the one I want to point out is calculate variable importance. So check that. Hit OK. It actually does affect the results a little bit. Yep. Um, train object classifier. Yeah. Edit. Oh, it has to be random. It has to be random trees. Got it. Yes. For this particular and then yeah, this this. calculate variable importance. Then view show log. Yeah, this is gonna look different, but I think this will work. Okay. Then in this nice new log viewer, um, one of the lines towards the bottom will say variable importance. And this is a list of the weighting factors of all measurements it's using and how important they are to the classifier, ranked in order. So um, it is finding that the single most important measurement is the parallax inverse difference moment of the Eason channel. I, I don't know what the difference between the different parallax features are, but it's very common that um, for eosinophils, like they have texture, they have granules. And this is why we measured them in the first place is because this tends to be very important. In addition, it just wants the total amount of ESN, the standard deviation of ESN, and then just all of the different ways of measuring the factor of ESN. Um, this makes sense. If you look at this and go, wow, that I can't believe that's the most important measurement, that's kind of a sign that it that it hasn't it hasn't captured the essence of an ESN at all. Um, yes. Change the interest of extreme. You can. Um, uh, so by default, it's using everything available. Um, if you go to features, all measurements, selected measurements, um, that enables this button that is select. And this, you can choose whichever ones you want. Um, one thing that's a little weird is as soon as you set this up, it actually unselects everything and you have to actively go in and select. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hit select all. Then I'm going to look for the smoothed measurements and go, you know what? Eosinophils are individual cells. I really don't care about what's going on in the neighborhood. I'm going to uncheck everything about the smooth measurements that we used to find the faults. Um, and then, and again, this is a little weird. You have you have to really actively delete that so that the um, the, the chosen measurements come back up on screen. Um, without that, uh, it won't work. It apply? It's from the tree. Yeah. Uh, features, selected measurements, select. It feels like just use all the measurements. Everything's better. Like the more me more data. Um, except if you put in a bunch of irrelevant data, it's going to find patterns in it. Like it will pull a yeah. feature that doesn't you have more measurements than data points. Yeah, it's very easy to fit some kind of pattern. Yeah, yeah. I mean that makes sense intuitively, yeah. but I've just like in my experience, I've never found that it was easier or felt better to remove measurements versus just adding better training rate. The time I use it a lot is in uh, multiplex fluorescence. Um, I want to classify one channel independent of all other channels so that I can truly look for double positives and not have them relate to each other. Okay. Um, yeah, even then I'll, I'll keep going. Like, do you even need this versus just a single yeah. measurement classifier? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you do. Know. We'll, we'll get there. All right. Yeah. And generally speaking, this is a, we are at the stage where you learn that the hammer exists. And you've yeah. got some practice, but you're not going to build uh, an antique table or an antique looking table with the skills you have right now. Okay. So um, it, it the, the process of crafting those machine classifiers is quite elaborate and there's no like prescription, do this and this is going to work. It's done by practice and you've got to try stuff until it works. And for certain kinds of images, 
um, it might be that you need certain things and it's going to be completely irrelevant for others. Okay. Another, yeah. uh, another place this comes into play is with the pixel classifier, which you can have also a very large number of measurements and is far more computationally intensive. So the ability to remove measurements that are, say, very low on that list of variables of importance means your classifier will update faster, less likely to kill your computer, your whole analysis will run faster. So, and also tends to generate better than the true messages you have. All right. Um, once you're happy, give it a name, hit save. Um, okay. Um, so we classified bolts, we classified epithelium, we classified eosinophils separately. Um, Do you have to retrain each image? Let's say you have 10 images. Yes. You have to retrain Real, them. Really good point. Please do not do that. Let me show you how to do this. Um, I wish I had, uh, we were trying to keep the train, the images you had to download small because yeah. internet. Cool. Um, so I didn't give you like lots and lots of repetitions of the same basic type. So what I'm going to do is duplicate this and just pretend it's a, call it long two and just pretend it's a different sample. It's not, but eh. Um, okay. So while she's doing that, let me kind of sketch the, the landscape for you. You do exactly the same processing steps on the second image. All of the measurements, all of the cell detections, all of the smoothed features, everything needs to match, okay? So it's best to do that using a script, which we will do. Don't worry about that. Um, and then you train, you provide your training objects on all of those images. And then once that stuff is done, um, there is a menu in that um, classifier window, which is called load training where you can load framing from the entirety of your project. Now you know why projects are so important, right? Because if you had only one image open, you wouldn't be able to do even that step. Yeah. So, okay. Now we have long one, we have long two. Um, we have annotations in each um, for ignore any eosinophils. Train object classifier. Load training. I'm going to take the two images where I actually worked on eosinophils, hit the little carrot, um, say, I want these, I'll find, and it updates, and now it's using uh, all of the data that you have given it. Super important to train on a um, representative sample of your data. Yes. So then in that instance, would you go back to your first and also apply so that they have the same training data? apply to their, like for instance, you put 20 new points in this one, right? Yeah. So then would you go re-update your training? Or you, so you don't update your training um, in that like the training is set. What you do is you you do as many, much of this as you want. You can add as many images here as you want. Um, save a final classifier um, and then apply that classifier to everything. Um, but in general, you don't want to like duplicate your data files. You want to duplicate the process of detecting and measuring your cells so okay. that like you have, they should be independent cells. Okay. There's a couple of ways of going about it. If you want like in the end, one set of objects with a classifier, then yeah, you need, a, you need one segmentation. It could be a pixel classifier. It could be cell detection. Um, if they're like just vastly different and you're not exactly comparing them, you could do one pixel classifier to find cells, then a separate pixel classifier to find bacteria, and then you just have your two stuff and you're just fine. You're going to um, use a pixel classifier to find them in the first place. Um, but once you have the pixel classifier detections, the uh, training looks exactly the same. It doesn't matter. Alternative is to use super pixels or tiles. Okay. There are other objects in Cuba that you can use if you cannot redefine really a cell 